the chair of this session, uh, which is not myself, so you'll be grateful, somebody new. <laughs> so we've got Hannah Qureshi. Um, Hannah graduated from SOAS with a degree in philosophy in 2020. Uh, whilst at university, she was the co-editor-in-chief of the student newspaper, where she contributed to articles on current affairs, national news and student politics. After graduating, Hannah spent over a year working in publishing as an editorial assistant in the non-fiction department at Atlantic Books, and she has worked across a range of titles spanning from history, politics, and investigative journalism. And we're now happy to say that she has started working at NCF um, in October, so very, very recently, um, joining us in our amazing Future Leaders program, where she hopes to build her career in the charity sector. So a big welcome to Hannah Stahl. I'll do a very quick summary of our next guest joining us. Um, I don't think anything I could say would ever do justice, but I will sum it up, and I think three paragraphs is what I've been given to sum it up in. Um, but up to my right here, um, OBE is a leading figure in the humanitarian and charity sector. Um, Dr. Herning was awarded the Hamilton Bailey Prize in Medicine at City Hospital in 1981. Um, Birmingham, UK, and completed a Doctorate of Medicine in Photopathology from the University of Birmingham Medical School. He is the co-founder of Islamic Relief, uh, the largest Western humanitarian NGO, as well as the founder of the lovely Muslim Charities Forum and the Humanitarian Forum. He has over 30 years uh, worth of experience within the humanity sector, visiting over 70 countries in pursuit of improving the lives of all people. So if we give a great warm welcome. My name is Hannah, um, and I started just a month ago as one of the future leaders on MCF's Future Leaders Programme, and I feel very, very honoured to be able to host this discussion between both Dr. Hani and Brother Moisem. Um, they both have such a wealth of experience, and I'm sure we'll be able to benefit from your time and your wisdom, inshallah. So we don't have long, so I'm going to jump straight into it, um, starting with Dr. Hani, inshallah. Um, we're celebrating MCF's 15th anniversary this year. I want to know what you're most proud of that MCF has achieved since you established it over a decade ago. Being sitting next to you. <laughs> Seriously, I'm not joking. If I sit only next to Muazzam or some old people like myself, it's a failure. It's a failure. That means our message is failing. It's not reaching the generation to come. Being the difference between you and me could be two years, 50 years, we are the more. To attract this generation is a success story. And it's a message for every CEO, every director. If you don't have them in your organization, on your board, you are a failing failure in action. Thank you. I'm, just happy to her. I'm glad that um, MCF has been able to facilitate that. And I've only been here for a month, but I can already say like I've been given so many opportunities and have already been pushed so far out of my comfort zone in just the month that I've been here. So I'm very, very grateful for what the future leaders have given me so far. Um, and inshallah, uh, so much more in the next nine months. Um, so moving on to more of them. Um, of course, we've kind of we've heard your introduction, and we're very aware of all of the experience that you have, and you have such a wealth of experience in diplomacy and international development work. Um, I was wondering how you hope to use this expertise in your role as incoming chair. Um, so, as I said earlier, I haven't grown up in the Muslim charity sector, so I'm I'm I'm, I'm going to say again, I've got a lot to learn. Um, so it's 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 very nice to be invited to comment on the experience. I've had, and of course I will uh, look to deploy that experience at the service of MCF. Um, but the place that I need to start is not to offer my experience, the place that I need to start is to, is, is to learn, and to look at the challenges that face the sector and to see how I can engage with and support that. Um, in terms of my experience, I guess 
most of my career has been spent understanding how uh, change happens, right? How governments work, how citizens and media and parliaments and politics engages with government, and the, and and how a process of social change happens. Because essentially, that's what international development is about. But that too is the work of the people in this room, right? None of us go to work because we hope to keep things the same. Right? All of us go to work because we're thinking about how to make change. And making change is not just about spending bits of money. Making change in a sustainable way that actually leads to lasting change is about spending resources wisely. And resources here means not just a food parcel that you deliver, but how you act as a person, how you act as an institution, as an organization, the choices that you make. So I hope that... Uh, what I will be able to do with MCF and indeed through MCF with others is to demystify the, the, the process of government right? because I'm, I'm conscious that a lot of the organizations in the sector are relatively small and international diplomacy is a big word, it's, you know, the foreign office and the UN and you know, the World Bank, they, they sound like great big words that are remote and distant and these kind of monsters in, in your world but actually they may be big organizations with lots of people and lots of money, but they're still people. They're people who are fundamentally trying to think about also, frankly, how to build a better tomorrow. And I can help you guys to mystify that a little bit, uh, to understand how those authorities work. I can also, I hope, uh, having spent a lot of time with politicians and senior bureaucrats and international policy makers, uh, I hope I can also bring some of those networks into play, right? Because I talked earlier about the need to put us on the map, to be confident about who we are. And uh, I, I, I think, you know, some of the networks and the relationships that I have may be able to help us uh, in understanding how to present ourselves with confidence, uh, even whilst we continue on that journey of maturing as organizations and as a sector and as a community in this country. Amazing. Is this working? Oh, here we go. Uh, amazing, thank you. Um, Dr. Hani, I wanted to um, kind of touch on your experience as well in the humanitarian sector. You've got nearly 40 years experience um, in the sector and you've seen many Muslim charities grow and flourish and make a very real difference to the lives of thousands of people all over the world. Um, However, I think it's important that we regularly check our intentions and are always thinking of new ways of doing things and how we can do things better um, in order to make the most effective change. So I wanted to ask what areas of improvement you think Muslim charities should be focusing on and prioritizing? Uh, before I answer this question, I forgot the second success story, okay. which is to be sitting next to Muazzam. It means that there is succession planning. It means that there is no leadership forever. It means that the trustees are trying to get the best in the community, from the community. When I was listening to his speech, a speech that I cannot articulate because of my culture, because of my language. Here there is a lay team. When I give you the stick, not the banana. Okay? And he leads for a second uh, uh, period of time. And this is a message to all the Muslim charities. No one is indispensable. Mm -hmm. And this is my first step for answering your questions. Muslim charities need to understand what governance is about. What is the value of women and young people inside the organization? What the quality of leadership of women and, uh, and young people inside the organization. Women carries a culture, young people carry culture, and I and Muazzam carry a different culture. And we have to marry the three cultures together. There is no monopoly and there is no unisex organization. This is the first thing. The second thing is transparency. Transparency, people use all the means, whether it's lawful or unlawful, legal or illegal, ethical or unethical, to fundraise, which is for me is deadly. It has nothing to do with the Islamic values. Be very transparent and say I've done a mistake. 
then the community will respect you when you confess this. You cannot hide your mistake because you are dealing with public money. Public money is the money belongs to the orphan, to the needy, to the widow, to the victims of rape, displaced people, and refugees. You have to stand up for the international and local humanitarian standard, which one of the most important elements of it is transparency. Transparency and accountability. Accountable to whom? In once upon a time, we were actually sitting somewhere and we were talking to one another, and we said to the trustees, who are you accountable to? I am accountable to God, because he's a trustee. I said, also I'm accountable to God. If God asks you, he asks me. But who is our accountable? He should be accountable to this young, miserable looking orphan. And the orphan should be his reference point before Allah. This is accountability. Fourth point is when actually uh, communication and networking and building partnership. No one can do it alone. No one. No matter what. We have got to have something in Europe you could uh, SCHR. SCHR is a coalition of the largest international the Muslim organization in the whole world. World Division, Red Cross, and uh, Plan International, Save the Children, and so on. They sit down together to coordinate and to connect. Who are we to say that, no, I don't want to sit down with him because he is from this group, or she is from this group, or she is from this group? Or... No. When we talk about public money, it's not our money. We should lower our gaze and remove our ego and our logo from the table, from the discussion. This is something which is very challenging. I don't want to carry on because I give the chance to my leader. Yeah, I think that's some very, very, very good advice. And I hope that many of us in this room can implement that and take that forward. Um, moving the conversation on slightly, I think, a conversation which has been quite prominent in recent years, and rightfully so, is the if issue of climate change and climate crisis, the climate disaster. We can see it all around us with the floods in Pakistan recently and um, the drought in East Africa. Um, it's something that not just Muslims, but the entire world really needs to be taken very seriously. And Muslim, you've, you've just joined the World Resources Institute, which is one of the best global think tanks working on sustainability. So I wanted to ask what steps you think Muslim charities can take to really combat climate change and implement uh, sustainable practices within their organizations? So I think, uh, so climate change is perhaps one of the greatest challenges facing us as a human race, right? Uh, yes, we are beginning to see the impact of climate change play out around the world, whether it's in floods or cyclones or you know, food crises, and it's not, you know, Pakistan's been very prominent, but at the beginning of the year, uh, there were weather-related events in southern, uh, in, in southern Africa, which were really very dangerous. There's a food crisis and the risk of famine in, in the Horn of Africa. Um, you know, so we really are beginning to see climate change play out. But we are still, at this stage, only in a 1.2 degree uh, world, right? And Right now, COP27 is underway at Chamoche, and people are fighting for a one and a half degree world, but there are also already many prominent voices which believe that we will breach the one and a half degree world. Um, and so we face a very dangerous future. Uh, our children face a very dangerous future. A future where we will see extreme weather related events, where we will have to see shifts in lifestyles, but we will also see great deprivation. We will see uh, people on the move as a result. We will see parts of, of land disappearing. You know, as ambassador in Indonesia, I went to I went to uh, Sumatra, to the coastline that faces across the straits uh, to uh, Singapore and Malaysia. And I asked the governor, what does climate change mean to you? And he said, the cl climate change means to me, Malaysia getting closer. Because as we get to a one and a half and two degree world and my landmass goes underwater, 
and we suffer the consequences of that. Not only will my people suffer the consequences, but Malaysia is going to come close because of the international boundaries. So people are living the reality of this around the world. I'm not sure, when I look at the work of the sector, we are very focused on humanitarian activity. And I can understand that that is the impetus uh, for a lot of our donors, right? For, 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 for our communities, they want to give food parcels or kurbani or whatever, that, you know, they want to see a water well, etc. But actually the challenges that we face are long term. And so there's work for us to do as the sector to engage with that long term risk of climate change. We need to educate ourselves. Right? We need to reflect this challenge in how we work. Single-use plastics, we must stop. Right? Uh, the choices we make, absolutely. Right? This, we, we, have, we have to start from home. You have to start from home. No, 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 please drink the water. Please, please, please drink the water rather than open hand. Please drink the water. Uh, I've already been drinking mine. Uh, but it has to start at home, right? We have to put our own houses in order. So, single-use plastics, do we yeah, leave the lights on? Do we leave the lights on unnecessarily? Do we take public transport? Do we get in a car? What, you know, as organizations, what incentives do we, do we uh, create in terms of how we travel, where we travel? It has to start at home. We have to think about our lifestyles, and as leaders in our organizations, we need to take that into our organizations to look at the practices. So, for example, at the World Resources Institute, yeah, you know, we're, we're reasonably well advanced given the nature of, uh, of that organization's mission in this. But we're just about to start monitoring uh, greenhouse gas emissions in our supply chain, right? So not only have we been doing work on our own travel and, you know, in the sustainability of our own office, but we're now beginning to look at the su sustainability practices in our supply chain. Now, this is a large organization, 2,000 people, you know, we're in a different stage of development, but perhaps we can do that. But I think that is some of the stuff that we will need to do uh, as we as we move forward as a sector. But it does start with, with thinking hard about consumption and lifestyles. And I think this, again, you know, links back to faith and, and, and the nature of, of, you know, our teachings and our tradition to, to look at the natural, at, look at natural resources, not as something that is a gift from God that we can simply eat and enjoy, but to think hard about what it means to be a trustee of the assets that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has given us, and how we think about those assets, how we protect those assets, and how we invest in the future sustainability of those assets. So I think there's a lot of work to do actually in this for the Muslim charity sector. I'm very, very pleased that MCF has been, indeed with colleagues and partners, uh, been uh, pioneering work in this area with the Big Green Week. Um, but I think this is a start. Uh, there's a long, long way to go for us and a huge challenge for us as this generation, but actually for our future generations too. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, is it working? Here we go. Thank you. I, um, <coughs> I just have unfortunately left my best questions till last, and we now only have about five minutes. So I'm going to. We, we can make it 10 minutes. We can make it 10 minutes. If Doc says you can make it 10 minutes, there we go. Make it 10 it's 10 minutes. minutes. Um, <laughs> so Dr. Hani, um, as a human humanitarian, you've been able to meet and serve people from all corners of the globe. Um, I want to know what's the most valuable lesson you've learned from your time working in the field? To see the truth of the reality and to feel that you are connected. Because if you go to them and you don't connect, you have a big problem in yourself and myself. To learn from them that they are far more better than us, but they have been tested by Allah differently. They're more patient, more visionary, more innovative, more welcoming, with big heart. I learned a lot from the children of Bosnia uh, nearly 30 years ago. That's why I started carrying Srebrenica 
flour. I learned a lot from the children of Syria, no matter what. Yemen, because if you consider them your children, you are in. If not, you are out, no matter what you have of resources. I learned a lot from the children of Somalia, of Iraq. All those should be considered my children, and their mothers are my sisters, and their fathers, whether they are alive or dead, are my brothers. This is what you need to learn. It's not about how much money we raise, not about how many packets of food or food parcels that we distribute. It's about how much feeling you raise in your heart to raise such a feeling in the heart of other communities. It's how much love those people love you so you can absorb their love to spread it to love other people on the globe. And this is what I learned. I'm not going to specifically give you an emotional speech about a story, which I have a lot of stories, but as Brother Muazzam said, it's not time about emotion, it's not time about traditional work. We have to go forward, to go from the emotional response, humanitarian response, into building community, building capacity, making strategy, creating culture, creating philosophy of certain, creating a biology, making research, and leading, I will not tolerate you if you don't lead. I'm serious, I'm not joking. I'm not sitting next to you to just look at me and you be in front of everybody. I'm sitting next to you because I believe that one day you become a leader. And this is the duty and the responsibility of everyone in this room and outside this room to keep creating young leadership to keep creating future for the future generation to come. To keep standing up and don't lower your head or your back for anybody else. Once you lower it, you will be, it will be lowered forever. But once you keep your, your head high above your shoulder, nobody can force you to lower your head down. Not I'm sitting next to you because I believe that you Sister Safa, Sister Salma, and brother, all of you are leaders. And the good leader amongst us is creating leadership while he is in a leadership position. Creating the leadership of the young people when he or she is a leadership position. Don't cry when you leave the organization, when you are a chairman or a CEO or a director. Oh my God, I was trying to. No, you're not. If you were, you could have done it. If you want, you could have done it. Leadership of a younger generation should be created while you are in leadership. You got it? Yeah. And you are very happy. You know why? Because I'm not in MCF anymore. <laughs> Otherwise, you could have seen my ugly face. Oh my God, I got somebody here. It was uh, Jengi Bengi, uh, Jengi, <laughs> and Shaheen as well. They saw my ugly face in the 80s. Is that right, Jengir? It's always been beautiful. <laughs> my ugly face is beautiful? That's it. So leadership creation is at the time, that, at the time when you are a leader, at the time when you leave your position. Thank you. Um, my final question um, is for Brother Moazim. I, on a personal level, would really like your advice and to know the answer to this question but um it kind of stems around this idea of diversity and inclusion which are very kind of words that i've come to kind of hate at this point um but there's been a lot of talk about diversity in all industries um but i think true diversity and true inclusion is a lot more than just having a few kind of black and brown faces on the cover of your corporate website. There's a lot more that goes into that in terms of making a, a truly inclusive environment for people who aren't middle class white men. Um, and you are a very clear example of how it is possible to kind of break that glass ceiling and to rise to the highest levels of kind of British policy and politics and diplomacy. Um, 
But I'm sure, as you mentioned in your speech earlier, that you faced a lot of issues um, and gone through a lot of different challenges to get to that, that point. One of those issues being institutionalized Islamophobia. Um, so what I want to know is, what advice would you give to young Muslims and young Muslim activists who may be struggling or feel, feel defeated in the face of these problems, who kind of feel like these problems are so much bigger than they are, and it doesn't matter how much work they do or how much they fight, um, they, they can't really see the light at the end of the tunnel. So what advice would you give to those young Muslims? So, I'm not sure how helpful this is to say it. But, 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 the, but, but the first thing to say is don't be faked. Mm -hmm. It's doable, right? These institutions may look difficult, but it is possible to break into them. I'm not the only one. There are now many, actually. Many young Muslims, many older Muslims too, frankly, who have managed to progress into government, into politics, uh, into journalism, into all walks of life. Not enough, but, but this glass ceiling has been breached and it's doable. The necessity to do it is urgent. You know, um, I spent 20 years in government and I worked at all levels in the British government with uh, governments of different colors uh, coalition governments, Labour, Conservative, etc. And I spent a lot of time working also in international organizations and with governments around the world, including the US government. You know, I've been in and out of the Pentagon and so on. And I have to tell you, and this may come as a shock, but by and large, people want to do good. I have very, very rarely in my life met somebody who wants to do something bad or evil just because that's how they see the world. People want to do good, but they want, but they do good on the basis of what they know and the frame of reference that they have, right? This is what they know, and doing good means going down that road. That may be the wrong road, but they're setting out to do good. And so the criticality of diversity, the criticality of diversity, and the reason that our young people need to be on those barricades, bashing down those doors, is because you need to change that frame of reference. If you believe the world is going in a wrong direction, then you've got to step up and say, I'm gonna change that frame of reference because I want to do good, but by changing that frame of reference, I'm gonna change how they think and how they see the world, okay? And certainly in my experience over the last, uh, over the 20 plus years that I had in government. There were one or two occasions where I experienced what felt like racism and Islamophobia, but only one or two, only one or two. It is possible to navigate those waters. And yes, you have to think about who you are and how you present yourself. And, you know, maybe I would have been less ready to identify, uh, you know, uh, or less ready to present myself as a Muslim at the very beginning of my career. But that reflected my immaturity. And certainly for young people who are in the civil service now, the frame of reference has changed. They're able to be themselves in a way that I couldn't be when I started out on my journey. So the journey is critical. It is entirely feasible. Education is the key. Education is the key. But the other key is to engage with the mainstream, right? You've got to break out of your isolation. You've got to engage with mainstream organizations, whether it's in universities, whether it's in political societies, whether it's in sports or whatever you're interested in, so that you not only can express who you are, but you can understand the other frames of reference and work out how to navigate those. And that's a responsibility that falls not just on young people, but critically, and as Dr. Hani has been emphasizing throughout this conversation, that falls on us as elders to create those opportunities, to mentor, to encourage, to support, to open the doors 
for our children and our young people to be able to walk through with confidence, <laughs> with their heads held high, knowing that they can contribute and indeed their contribution is essential. And it's a doable thing, right? We are 5% of this country's population. In London, we are 10%. I don't know how many we are in Birmingham, but it's lots. 50%. 50%. You know, uh, we're not going anywhere. This is our country. This is our future. Right? And we need to take that not, we need to take that as a right. This is our right as citizens in this country to participate in society, to give of our best, and indeed to expect of the best too. And so, you know, again, MCF can play some small role in, in, in bringing people together, in opening eyes, in creating opportunities, in nurturing leadership, and the collaboration a collaboration because our community is much too fragmented. Those connectors that Dr. Hani has spent his life trying to build, those connectors and that collaboration is the thing that will help us get through this. And other communities have done it. Yeah. You know, I, I grew up in Northwest London. Um, I bought my first house in Wendley. At that time, my neighborhood still had f four or five Jewish uh, delicatessens and kosher shops and so on. And I would go and pick up their free literature, right? And for a community of 200,000 people, the maturity of their engagement, their dialogue, their positioning is remarkable. So minorities can do this, but it requires coming together, having courage, having ambition, and supporting each other to find our place. Thank you. Thank you. I could really sit and carry on having this conversation with you both all evening, but I'm getting lots of lots of signals from around the room that I need to wrap up. So um, just again to say thank you for giving us your time and giving us your advice and your wealth of knowledge and experience. And I'm sure everyone in this room has benefited um, from listening to you today. So I know you're both probably around for quite a while, so we can kind of carry on these conversations, I hope, in, in our own time. But, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will learn from your uh, humility, inspiration, uh, and we can continue and carry on, inshallah, on, on this uh, uh, on this mission and journey. Uh, and you planted the seed, and inshallah, we and others who are coming after us will, will continue. <coughs> Uh, I have a few colleagues here I would like to, if you, they don't mind, say a few words. And may I start with uh, and, uh, someone who blessed us tonight, Imam Qasim. Uh, and you? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah wa kafa wa salatu wa salam wa salam wa salam wa Indeed, blessing is mine, and I'm blessed to be here um, with uh, Dr. Hani. I just saw Richard here, our old friend. Uh, welcome to the gathering. Um, and, uh, I'm indeed honored uh, to be part of such a diverse group, mashallah. Uh, Dr. Hani, uh, subhanAllah, is uh, our forefather, like Adam Islam. if I may compare. Not in terms of age or being angry, but in terms of uh, founder. Uh, Adam al Islam was founder of humanity and so on and that. Uh, humanity started from him, he was the first human being. But in UK, the first person who visualized for Muslim community to have their um, network and their basically uh, organization to discharge one of the five pillars of Islam, not just as an optional charity, but to discharge their Islamic responsibility, one of the five pillars of Islam, zakat, and assist with basically many pillars of Islam, for example, through those organizations or through those activities, mm -hmm. giving opportunity to people to offer salah, to Past, to go for Hajj, because these are the activities of many organizations, mashallah. 
So subhanAllah, he's been uh, foundation of those pillars that we are standing today upon. So thank you very much, mashallah. And um, I know, you know, not only me, but I think all those brothers who are sitting here, especially in first and second rows and so on, um, can say that whenever they think of role model for themselves, for a point of reference, for someone as a mentor, uh, is Dr. Khan. Um, and uh, I'm inspired, mashallah, by him. Uh, for me, uh, in UK, there are very few people. There's Dr. Hani, there is Brother Saif Ahmed, there is Brother Jahangir, mashallah, although Jahangir is quite young compared to these two, mashallah. Um, but mashallah, I mean, these are the leaders from the, uh, that we are blessed and fortunate. Um, they talked about basically uh, Muslim charities performing better in the situation of, uh, you can say, crisis. And I want to give one uh, very quick example of that. When the end of famine in Africa was declared, after that, I became active on Water for Africa project. And I stood up and I said, no, it's not end yet. There's a lot of work needs to be done. And we started, alhamdulillah, at that time, delivery on water projects to the extent that we had to sometimes dig one kilometer into ground, half a kilometer into ground. And Richard knows, because Richard and I used to work together at that time on these things. We used to hire petroleum companies. And then um, we, we basically constructed our own machinery, our own equipment. SubhanAllah, at that time, when they said that basically famine of Africa is finished, Literally, we spent about 10 million pounds. Al Khair Foundation was registered as a charity organization in 2008, but I was very, very hesitant to ask for donations. Very hesitant. You know, I was imam in my mosque for eight years, and I didn't ask for a single penny donation, even for uh, my teacher's organization. But 2010 11, you know, when the situation came, at that point, I had no choice but to start it, mashallah. And the first person I spoke at that time was Dr. Hani himself, mashallah. And he gave me a few words and few advice. He may not remember because he has given advice to tens of thousands of people around the world, mashallah. So anyway, Zakullah, um, Dr. Hani, you are the foundation for us. And we are standing uh, on you in terms of supporting pillars. It's only right to ask Sister Shaheed to come up. Yes, come on. Come on, otherwise I'll, my wife will kill me. Say, who's among the sisters spoke? We just uh, we'll be listening to our leaders. You know, where's diversity of young people, where diverse of sisters? Those who learned from the doctor. Thank you, Assalamualaikum. It's a pleasure to stand here in front of everyone. Uh, I think some of you I already know, and others who I don't. I was one of the founders of Islamic Leaf USA, alongside Jahangir and Dr. Hani was the one that sent us. There was no HR in those days. Uh, it was, would you like to go to America? And I said, well, I've already been as far as Bradford. He said, yeah, don't worry about it. It's not that far. We were meant to be there for three months. We stayed there eight years. It was one of the most wonderful experiences ever. Um, we established Islamic Leaf USA, which is probably one of the largest fundraising entities um, as, as, a, as a Muslim charity. But one thing I do want to say is, with all the messages that have come today, um, I'm also the chair of ICBA, which is um, a chair of 140 aid agencies based in Geneva. Competing with us. <laughs> competing with? <laughs> MCF. No, no, yeah, yeah, competing with MCF. And I sit on the principles, which is basically, I sit with the emergency relief coordinator, which is Martin Griffiths. We have a meeting coming up in the next couple of weeks on Somalia. I would like to encourage, collectively, there's 150 years worth of experience in this room. 38 years is some leave. 
X number of years, if I just think about the amount of uh, what we've done collectively, not just financially, but I would really encourage all of us to think about what is it that we want to achieve in the next 30 years. We have not changed one policy. We have not changed anything in terms of, yes, we can come together as a Muslim collective, and we will. But really, we need to change the way that refugees are thought about, the way that we think about as, us as charities. When we are, as Brother Muslim said, when we are collectively in that space with other organizations, and I can see that. I am different in that space, but I see the change representation can make, and that was a, a question that you put forward. Representation means a lot. I just want to thank Dr. Honey for everything that he's done um, so far and that he will continue to do. There's been many times where Dr. Honey and I have been on journeys together. Very wise journeys, very interesting journeys, very funny journeys. A lot of jokes. A lot yeah. of bad jokes. Yeah, bad I have jokes. to say, you guys don't tell good jokes. Yeah, we are more jokes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, thank you, Dr. Honey. Thank you to MCF. Thank you, uh, Brother Fadi. Brother Muslim, we welcome you to the Muslim Charities Forum and inshallah, hopefully collectively we can move forward with so much more work that needs to be done. Exactly. Allah is safe. Don't be sharp. Come over. Safe. Yeah. But don't be sharp. You are always uh, Assalamu alaikum. I'm humbled to speak for a giant. It is, uh, I think the reality is that Dr. Hani al Banna comes from the generation of Muslim thinkers who has been struggling to make Islam a living reality. Allah exists, it's not a figment of imagination. Allah does exist in every moment of our time and the, and the breath we take. So to instill that values and that mission, Hani al took Islamic belief as the vehicle and what a revolution he has created. Not only the Islamic belief itself, but the creation of hundreds of Muslim charities in this country. And I'm sure all of you will agree the founder of that movement is none but Dr. Hani al -Banda. Now Allah gave me the opportunity in the early days of Dr. Hani al initiative. At the same time, Cat Stevens and Yusuf Islam's initiative of Muslim Aid came simultaneously. And among the few young volunteers, I played a small little role uh, to do that work. And Hani sent me in 1992 to see the Rohingya refugee programs in Cox's Bazar area, the remote area. How passionate he was, and he was asking uh, questions in regard to what I had seen on the ground, etc. So my concluding comment is that, uh, that we pray for Allah, pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah gives Hani al a long life to guide and inspire many people in Britain and beyond. And he is a shining example for all of us to follow in his footsteps. Salaam alaikum. Someone on the chair, Ali Abdurrahman. Oh. Very patient. Very, uh, may Allah accept from you. He planted the seed and watered the seed of Dr. Hani, and then we are now trying to grow this plant a bit. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. So I need to move closer here. Yeah. <laughs> so for those who don't know me, uh, I uh, worked with Dr. Hani at the beginnings of the MCF when it was just a piece of paper and a charity registration uh, for six years until. Uh, Fadi came in afterwards to take it, mashallah, to grander, grandeur, and, and new great levels. Uh, and and some of uh, the people here actually are old trustees, Jahangir, Uthman, some of the others are new trustees, some are probably future trustees, 
uh, as well. Uh, and we were talking earlier about you know the old school and the new school merging together. Um, but uh, but in this journey, it's been a challenge throughout. I mean, all the issues you mentioned, funding, uh, uh, you know, governance, uh, Islamophobia, uh, the risking. Uh, but uh, but few know actually that the issue of the risking started from MCF, mm. right? Started from a few Islamic charities screaming and saying, you know, these are all the challenges affecting us. We need to take it to another level. Right. And now it's a global issue that everyone recognizes. Um, and the credit, I think, is to the work that everyone did and the collaborative work that is possible through MCF. And there are many examples like that. You know, the amazing work that was done through COVID, very impressive uh, and throughout. <coughs> but, you know, it's, it's all thanks to the blessings of, of Dr. Hani, and he was able to, uh, through his antenna or satellite channels, communicate that through the other organizations. Um, and it's always been small, but, uh, but I remember, I think, uh, Mohamed Shakir, we used to work for, for uh, uh, MCF as well. We, we, we were on the phone with someone from Oxfam and was asking how many people work at MCF. Is it 50, 100? <laughs> Thinking that we're all over the world. But it's just, you know, a, a, a small group of dedicated people working day and night, including amazing young people. Um, and, and the reason why I know Dr. Harry talks about these amazing young people is because you know, all of these people here were once you over there, the future leaders, right? 20, 30 years ago, including Dr. Hani, uh, when he started, including Fadi, uh, when, when he came into this country. I'm still young. You're still young, yes. Dr. Hani is still young as well. Still under 60. But, uh, but, but, but there's, still, there's still work to do. I mean, it's not, uh, um, there's still work to do, and, and Dr. Hani has created an amazing chapter. Uh, and we're working, uh, we're hoping that, you know, Muazzam will be able to take it forward. Uh, and by the way, your name is very well known. I mean, we've been following you on the news uh, for the past 10 years, 15 years, some of us. Uh, so know all your achievements you've done uh, and that you are, you know, one of the greatest defenders of, of the FID in this country. Uh, that, you know, the major that many of us opposed, uh, you were one of the few in the system that were opposing it and have got credit even from within FCDO up to today for doing that. So, you know, Kudos for your recognition for all the work you've done for, for the past years. But the next level is, just one story I wanted to say that I read while I was coming on the train. As you mentioned in Indonesia, Dr. Hani mentioned about working for, for, for the people on the ground. is about uh, this group of researchers who are studying a local community in Indonesia. I think there's a region called New Guinea somewhere, right? Um, so the government decided to do some development in Indonesia. <coughs> And they decided in a very remote community where there were no roads, uh, uh, nothing, no health systems, they decided to send 100 cows as a development project in Indonesia. The community received it, and the first thing they did is that they saw these cows coming to their houses, uh, eating their grass, going to the toilet everywhere around their houses. So they killed 99 of them, and they kept one just for decoration. So a group of researchers went, and they said, what do you guys actually need? Can you tell us? And there were so many needs, you know, roads, hospital, school, everything. They said, we need 100 cows. What? 100 cows, why? Uh, they, were, they were just, you know, uh, amazed. And they, when they started studying it, they realized that the only concept of development they knew was cows. So the only thing they could ask was cows. And uh, and the only language of development they, they spoke was cows, right? So the researchers went and did obviously further analysis as to what exactly were the needs, why they were mentioning this, and they realized that it's not actually cows they, they need, but it's more than that. But the only language they can communicate to talk about development is cows, right? And the reason why I'm saying this is that we talk, we have so many initiatives, so many great projects that we can do. Uh, uh, but it's important to also understand the needs of the communities on the ground. And that's what effectiveness, and that's where we can go to the next level, next level uh, and, and improve our work. And secondly, uh, something I want to mention because I'm from Somalia, originally from East Africa, is not to forget forgotten crisis. Mm -hmm. I remember when I used to look at the pictures of the Trahari, we used to go to Chechenia, to places that nobody used to talk about in the 80s or 90s. And that was the strength of the charitable sector. And when he talks about, you know, it's not a fundraising machine, let's, let's not just go where, you know, the news is. Mm. 
let's go where the needs are, right? Um, and, and I'm from Somalia, it breaks my heart to see what's happening in Pakistan, right? But it breaks my heart also to see that going to mosques, when I hear about needs, I hear about Pakistan, not Somalia, not East Africa, which is also in deep, deep, dire need, and many other places in the world. So do not forget the forgotten. Thank you. Zakra. You can do humanitarian advertisement. <laughs> Sister Batul. Allahu Akbar. I love this response. <laughs> Sister Batul, she said, Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Allah is great. I I feel so humbled to be standing here before such giants of so much work that has been done here by Muslims all over the UK, all over the world. Really it's it's awesome, as they say. It's, it's fantastic, all of the work that's been done. And I feel I haven't even got words to accommodate how I think we all feel about all of that. Um, but the honey is very cheeky, though, you know, sometimes. I remember he was at the Islamic Foundation when I was working there. And he was coming out of the mosque there quite a few years ago. And he said to me, ah, Sister Batul, what are you doing here? Come and join us at Islamic Relief. He was trying to poach people, can you believe it? From one place to another. I remember, I remember actually when I turned around, Dr. Manada was coming walking behind us and I thought, I don't know how he's going to feel about that. But of course, Annie didn't care. And I often wonder, had I responded to that call, where I might be today. Uh, and you said, actually, you know, that there's Dr. Honey, he's running away now. Well, you know what? Looking at the age of myself and Dr. Honey, it would be great if we could run at this time in our lives. You know, Dr. Honey, there is the hadith that says, the hearts of the whole of creation are between the fingers of Allah. And subhanAllah, it's so wonderful that the hearts of creation called out to so many of you and so many of your organizations for help and for support. And you gave it so willingly, so well, so easily, so professionally, so endearingly with hearts full of love and empathy. And this is, I think, what we can all learn from this amazing legacy that you have left inshallah and that inshallah will continue for as long as long as possible may Allah bless you and keep you safe continue to have you pass on your wisdom and the generosity of your spirit to all of us young and old inshallah and I welcome Wazim into this fantastic uh, position and I know that you will you know you will rise to the call and do a great job, inshallah. For those who don't know Sister Batul, she's involved in a very niche project. Looking after the revert brothers and sisters. The category that has been neglected by the mainstream Muslim community. And Zakallah for coming. And here today you have in this room some of the key holders of the charity sector. And I hope, inshallah, you'll we'll be able to talk to them and they will open their hearts and then their pockets after that. Uh, so to support this cause, inshallah, because it's important to look after our uh, indigenous, if correct to call it this way, community, inshallah. Uh, someone who known Dr. Hani from Birmingham time. Ustaz, Ustaz Muhammad Walid, for Early days, the Muslim student house. 
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. I've known Dr. Hani from 1984 when I moved to live in London in Birmingham. I know that gentleman who has joking nature and the smiling face all the time. And he intervenes in everything. Wherever you look for him, you find him. In Muslim student societies, in Farsi societies, with the Pakistani brothers, with Bengali brothers, everywhere you can find him. And he was struggling. I know in student, uh, Muslim student house to secure a room for his a newly born uh, <coughs> Islamic relief. Mm. And he was struggling and struggling until he achieved his goal. And then he moved to the hall over there. And in no time, it was full with heaps of black <laughs> black uh, uh, you know back, back. bats and I don't exaggerate for life that the heaps nearly reached the ceiling which is around five meters high this is Hani Al-Banna, who was very determined. I am not, I don't like to read anybody, but he was very determined to do something in favor of this charitable cause. He was the father of the orphans, and he was the brother of the widows, and he proved that, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will reward him for all his doings and he accumulate his achievement with establishing with his other brothers MCS. And it is a very, very important in collaborative and collective work among the Muslim charities. جزاكم الله خير وبارك الله فيكم وجزاك الله كل خير وإن شاء الله we'll find with our newly chairman and he ما شاء الله as I have I had heard from him a very very knowledgeable and productive character جزاكم الله خير بارك الله فيكم just for clarification and Zakallah for the reminder. Uh, we're not here to just make him happy. <laughs> we're actually here because we want you guys to document some of this history so we can all learn that how things is possible and how it can be done. And especially for our young people, because they think, you know, we woke up, we found those organizations established with a lot of money. Well, not a lot of bags. This bags business still up to now going uh, somewhere else. <laughs> Half of Birmingham was full of uh, plastic bags, you know, second-hand clothes. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you, Doctor, the, the father of the Muslim charity sector. Saadiyah. Haram? Saadiyah, Muhammad Shakir, and Abdurrahman, they were in the team, the golden team. Uh, they did a lot with Umayma. We, we try to get Umayma Bashir uh, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Let me ask uh, the person who lost his hair. We've seen some people lost their hairs here in the pictures, and some they changed the color of their hairs. I don't know why they're doing this business. <laughs> Osman, tafadal. Still have hair. <laughs> no, it's fake, the one he has. <laughs> Uh, I will not start from the beginning, just shall like a few points quickly. I think uh, Dr. Hani uh, for me is really a role model as I was one of the 
few people who started the journey with him from the beginning. So I was in MCF as when I was in Muslim hands. Then I moved, I represented the human appeal for seven years. And now we are in Action for Humanity, not Action for Humanity, we still not remember. Wait, shall we always? Inshallah. inshallah. Uh, we don't give so up. So I, I really appreciate what Dr. Hani has done. And we travel together, I think, to many, many parts around the globe, from Somalia. I think the first group reached Somalia in 2011, where we were busy with Syria crisis. We went to Somalia, and I think after that we went, I think, twice or three times. And I remember that unique journey to, to Somalia in 2011. Then we traveled, I think, Syria, Yemen. Uh, our participation in the humanitarian summit in 2016, and how many workshops we attended before that from Africa to Europe to Eastern Africa. So I think I traveled with him a lot. I learned a lot from Dr. Hani. And until you people in many places, they call me the mini Hani Banner. So uh, I'm proud of this, as I learned a lot from uh, Dr. Hani Banner, may Allah bless him. I think what I want to mention, one point which I think we really need to appreciate and uh, think about it deeply when we mentioned uh, when we speak about Dr. Hani Banna. Dr. Hani Banna, as you know, he left Islamic Relief, the first chair to leave a charity voluntarily in 28, 20, 2008. And now he as well voluntarily uh, left uh, uh, MCF. And I remember when I was part of the trustees, part of the board, we used to discuss this in every meeting, I'm leaving, I'm leaving. Alhamdulillah, finally he left. And I think this is in some, we haven't seen any, we haven't, we, we haven't seen in the whole sector, anyone really has done like Dr. Han to say bye-bye. And I know Dr. Han is not going to stay at home because he has many other projects in his head, which we, I think we discussed not in, if not in, in a daily basis, but at least a weekly, we have three, three, four times we discuss what is in his head. So may Allah bless him and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him good health and long life. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to learn from the experience because it's very easy to say we learn, but the problem is how we put of what we learn in practice. And this is, I think, the challenge for all of us. We have been hearing from Dr. Hani and discussing governance and trustees and, and, and I think the, the, this discussion will continue with Brother Muazzam and the rest of the trustees, but how much of that we can really apply in our organization and in our work. Dr. Hani was really a very clear example and role model that he has done many of what he preached, what he mentioned to us, what he talked to all of us. And he is an example of a practical person, which he will not leave it, even if, even if he left MCF as a chair, he will continue his journey, inshallah. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as he gathered us here with him, to gather us in the highest paradise. In the Amen. 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 Yes, come, come over. Come on, let's get up. Let's go. Sister, 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 one, two, three, come on. Can you bring some chairs for sister? Where do you want us to sit? Can you bring chairs? Chairs are here. Yes, can you bring some chairs for sister? Some chairs for sister. Some chairs for sister. More chair for sisters, more chair for sisters. 
And Dr. Harney told me go stand in Key for London. It's him and his family who supported me to start. Not many people know this. So. And even Dr. He didn't know that he's coming here. Okay. Uh, a small, where's the Habib? For the, uh, the, the nature. A small appreciation from the board to Dr. Hani. Thank you. 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 Thank you.